acceptably timely and I'll say what will be insightful discussion on uh, China's role in Venezuela. We're going to present you over the next hour and a half with new insight and ideas on how to think about China's engagement. And also, please uh, tweet your, uh, your comments, your questions using the hashtag AC. Venezuela. I'm Jason Marzak. I'm the director of the Adrian Arts Latin America Center, and I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Carrie Filippetti, Francisco Molnaldi, uh, Alejandro Grisanti, and Anne Lee. Uh, before diving into the discussion, I'm going to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Uh, nine months after the interim government began its role as the legitimate actor in Venezuela, as recognized by more than 50 countries, important progress has been made in laying the groundwork for an eventual democratic transition. Now, we all wish that transition would have already occurred, uh, but we cannot lose sight of the inroads that uh, have been made in building the apparatus of a new government with many of those advances and setbacks previously discussed right here in this, in this room. But the will of the Venezuelan people is being frustrated. It's being frustrated by a number of countries uh, around the world uh, focused on perpetuating Maduro's time in power. Uh, last month, we released a publication on Russia's intervention in Venezuela with scenarios of how Russia uh, could play spoiler and, and putting forward the facts on how Russia already is playing spoiler. And today we're here to look at China's role. We're here to look at the myths, the reality, and the future. What is the extent of China's support of Maduro? Has that support waned recently? How could that support wane? How extensive is China's role in Venezuela, Venezuela's oil industry, and what does the future hold? This, I think this nuanced understanding of China's role and ambitions is imperative for seeing, and also, more importantly, charting a road ahead, uh, which all, all of you know who follow our work, both on Venezuela and our work in China, this is a critical priority of the Adrian R. Latin America Center. I, I hope that each of you um, who um, walks out today uh, or finishes watching the webcast with insight that will further shape how you approach China's role uh, in, in Venezuela. I'm going to go ahead and invite our speakers to the stage and, and introduce, introduce them once they go ahead and sit down. So please, uh, all four of the speakers, please come to the stage here. I will, um, you have, you have um, seats with each of your names. Uh, Francisco Maldonado, you're here all the okay. way, all the way to the to the, the my, my audience far right, and then Anne Lee, Alejandro Grasanti, and, and Carrie Filippetti. Um, let me introduce first uh, Carrie Filippetti. Carrie currently serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cuba and Venezuela and the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Prior to this position, she served as Senior Policy Advisor for the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, uh, she where she advised U.S. Ambassador uh, Nikki Haley on issues related to counterterrorism in the Middle East and the Western Hemisphere. Um, Carrie, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Phil Petty is also, uh, we also have the, the tremendous uh, benefit of having her uh, coming to the United Council numerous times and always provides, provides such critical insight on a number of different issues. Uh, Next to Kerry is, um, is Alejandro Gasanti. Alejandro was appointed director of Venezuelan state oil company PDVSA's ad hoc board by interim president Juan Guaido and approved by Venezuela's National Assembly in April 2019. He's also the uh, founder of Eco Analytica in your previous life, uh, Alejandro, right? Uh, which is an important source of information, uh, incredibly reliable source for understanding the economics and politics of, of Venezuela. Next to Alejandro is Anne Lee. Anne is an internationally recognized leading authority on China's economic relations. She's the author of, of a number of books, one of, one of which is What Can the U.S. Learn from China? Another one of which is Will China's Economy Collapse? She's also a visiting professor at Peking University and an adjunct professor both at New York University and at, and at Pace University, University. So thank you very much, Anne, for joining us. Um, next to Anne is Francisco Monaldi. Francisco is a fellow in the Latin American Energy Policy um, at the Center for Energy Studies and the Center for the United States and Mexico. It's a long title, Francisco. Uh, and also the interim director of the Latin America Initiative and a lecturer in energy economics at Rice University. He's also the founding director and professor at the Center for Energy and the Environment at IESA in Venezuela. I'll also add to Francisco's uh, resume, he is a uh, Atlantic Council, uh, past Atlantic Council author, uh, of which his publications have appeared, his Atlantic Council publications have appeared on Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, where of course all of us go to get our information on Venezuela's oil industry. Um, 
Thank you again to all of you for, for joining us. We're going to look over the course of the discussion at the drivers behind China's interest, the extent and durability of its backing of Maduro, as well as the specifics for China's support and whether that can in fact be, be shaken. I'm also going to change things up and also ask questions to you uh, in the audience. Uh, so feel free to uh, uh, be a part of those 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 uh, those questions. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to ask questions using uh, the application called Poll Everywhere. And so at various points during the discussion, we're going to ask questions for you uh, to gauge the audience um, uh, uh, interest and 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 insight on on different issues as we move forward. We're going to start off. Um, I want to start off carry on China's global expansion, also look at China's involvement in Latin America, and start off with a with a broader ranging question. And that question is, frankly, first of all, how concerned are you about China's role in Latin America more broadly? But also, how concerned are you about the implications of China's role in the region and what that implies for U.S. interests? Sure. Thanks, Jason, and thanks so much for, for inviting me to participate in this event. Thanks for coming. Um, obviously, the, the United States has expressed um, that this is a real inflection point, both for Latin America writ large as well as for China's role in Latin America. Um, we we have increased our interest, I would say, in Latin America from the, from the United States. We've been very focused on promoting um, transparency, strengthening governance, um, assisting with different economic development, and of course, uh, enabling more respect for human rights throughout the region writ large. And we've seen a huge amount of engagement from my department's leadership um, within Latin America uh, to promote those objectives. And so when we look at China in Latin America, we're focused on three key principles, which is number one, fairness, number two, reciprocity, and number three, respect for sovereignty. And so when you combine those three principles for China's engagement in Latin America with what they're actually doing in Latin America, obviously we see some very significant gaps. And of course today we'll talk a lot about those gaps in Venezuela. The, the main one that I would focus on there is the respect for sovereignty question um, and the degree to which the, the Chinese government's support of the Maduro regime um, is, is really at odds with the will of the Venezuelan people. Um, and so when you, when you put our priorities together with what our priorities um, uh, for China are, um, we just we want it to be very clear that we are going to um, protect our allies, we are going to make sure that um, we're protecting our interests, and we're going to make sure that our allies are able to negotiate with China from a position of strength. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to move to, on a broader sense, uh, uh, China's uh, global uh, geopolitical interests uh, uh, before, we d before we dive more specifically into, into Venezuela and the region. Um, on, on the commercial side, uh, as, as, uh, as, as you've, you've written, China is now the world's um, second largest economy, uh, biggest net crude oil consumer and top buyer of, of copper, coal, uh, iron ore and, and soy, uh, foreign policy, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we recently put out a, a, a report here on Belt and Road in Latin America, 130 member countries, including 19 from Latin America and, and the Caribbean. How, do, how does this figure into, um, into China's top economic and, and political priorities internationally? What, what do you see currently um, as China's top priorities, uh, maybe even in the, within the context of uh, what, is, what is currently happening in, in Hong Kong today? Um, but but, but uh, what, 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 is, what is China's broader ambitions uh, 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 from a, a political but also an economic, economic front? So China's priorities, first and foremost, is to ensure that their country is um, able to grow. They still have half a billion people living in poverty still. And so in order to lift these people up, uh, there has to be economic growth. And the prerequisite for economic growth is peace and stability around the world. And so the Belt and Road Initiative is one of their vehicles for trying to create more peace and stability and economic growth in other parts of the world in order to allow China to continue to grow too. So they believe that if they take what they've learned in terms of their own economic growth and uh, put it in other countries, they can create other Chinas uh, in the world and therefore uh, this kind of economic growth miracle can continue for a very long time. Um, so I would say that is an overarching guiding principle around China, and their political ambitions are very much tied to these economic ambitions. And um, 
And so as it relates to, say, Hong Kong or Taiwan, they see that as part of China. And so from an international standpoint, they want to make sure that other countries are not interfering in their internal affairs. And so uh, as this relates to Venezuela, I guess they worry that if they don't um, support Maduro because it was his reelection and uh, the US you know, doesn't recognize it as valid, uh, they f see that as a you know, as violating sovereignty. And so they view that as possibly what could happen to them if uh, they allow this to happen to Venezuela. Then the U.S. may go to China and say, well, you know, we can meddle in your affairs too. So I think there's a bit of projection that's going on um, in terms of um, the situation in Venezuela with, you know, how China wants to operate. And, um, and so I'll leave it at that for now. So, so two, two different um, viewpoints on this question of respect for sovereignty. Uh, uh, Carrie, you say the guiding principle of, of US policy is for China to respect sovereignty and respect the will of the Venezuelan people. And Anne, uh, from, from, your, from, from maybe a Chinese perspective, is, 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 the, is the fact that the Chinese see um, uh, Maduro, despite the illegitimate uh, election, uh, as um, as being the, in their minds the the still the the, the legitimate leader, uh, and that support of, of Maduro is is respecting the sovereignty of of of, Venice, of Venezuela. And so there's a there's a fundamental kind of clash between those two ideas within the same principle of, of respect for sovereignty. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, we, we, we hear this argument all the time that, well, you know, Maduro was elected. Maduro was elected in what was universally recognized as fraudulent elections, right? And so when we talk about the constitution of Venezuela, when we talk about democracy, what we're really talking about is a country that was really one of the founders of democracy in the entire region. And the cornerstone of democracy is free and fair elections. The cornerstone of democracy is people being able to articulate their perspective without threat of harassment and intimidation. And what we saw after the, the May elections in 2018 was that across the board, all of these international observers says there was no way that these were free and fair elections. And so if you go back to the root of Venezuelan sovereignty, where does power come from? Well, it's a democracy, it comes from the people. So when the people are not able to express their will, then how can you possibly say that you're supporting the, the legitimate government of Venezuela if it wasn't elected by the people? And so that's why we say it is not a question of, of, of sovereignty to say that you're, you're supporting Maduro. You are violating the sovereignty of Venezuela because you are violating the will of the people, which is where their democracy comes from. I'll, I'll say to that, a amen. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so it's a matter of, 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 of kind of go trying to con convince the, sh put, putting out there the, the cost for China on, 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 on what China see, on, on not respecting the sovereignty or the, the will of the Venezuelan people and, 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 the, the, and, and changing the mindset of the Chinese with regard to respecting uh, what they see as, as, as sovereignty. I want to I wanna move it to you, Francisco, and talk uh, uh, briefly from a, a broader perspective about, about bilateral, bilateral trade. Between, trade between China and Latin America and the Caribbean uh, has grown 25 times according to uh, where I get my information, which is from the Atlantic Council, um, from 12 billion in 1999 to 306 billion in 2018. This places China as the region's second largest trading partner uh, after the United States. Since 2005, Chinese policy banks have provided more than $141 billion in loan commitments uh, to Latin America overall, which exceeds in many years the lending of, of the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the CAF Development Bank. Uh, Francisco, based on your experience working on regional economic trade, uh, energy issues, what do you see as driving the growing Chinese and take it from a broader perspective here, Francisco. What do you see as, as what do you see as driving the broader, the growing Chinese engagement with with Latin America, and and how has the region responded to China's incredibly um, uh, incredible uptake in, in its commercial relations? Sure. So I mean, there is a, a very important sort of a strategic overarching reason why China and Latin America it makes sense to have you know a, a very significant increase in. In, in trade, which is, you know, China needs, it's a massive importer of commodities, the largest importer of oil in the world. 
um, and the largest importer of many other uh, uh, mineral commodities and, and agricultural commodities. And Latin America happens to be uh, uh, the region that concentrates some of the most important reserves of those commodities. For example, the second largest after the Middle East. By the way, for the Chinese, it's also a strategic issue. You know, the, the, the risk of the, of the concentration of dependency on the Middle East, as it used to be the case for the US. Uh, and, and, you know, and Latin America offers a, a very important alternative to that. If you think about the energy transition, you know, lithium, uh, 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 you know, uh, copper are uh, heavily concentrated in Latin America. And, and, and for the Chinese, that, that's, uh, you know, a very important strategic uh, source of uh, uh, of natural uh, of natural resources. So I think in in the very long term, this is uh, something that the the Chinese consider uh, you know very important. I think all the other sort of strategies of loans, etc., are complementary to that sort of long term notion that this is you know uh, a, a continent in which they will want to be significantly involved and trade with because of these strategic reasons. For the Latin Americans, of course, this offers, you know, uh, uh, as you pointed out, you know, the, the, the Chinese loans uh, have surpassed, you know, multilateral uh, agencies in the, uh, uh, in the region. And of course, that offers, first of all, during the uh, commodity boom years and the sort of left turn in the region, it offered an alternative to, you know, the IMF or other uh, sources of, uh, uh, of funding. I think that, for example, fueled resource nationalism in, you know, in, in, in the region because you had an alternative to you know, the private companies and private capital. You can see it, for example, in Ecuador, that was a very, uh, a very clear case in which Correa basically gave the, you know, the oil industry uh, to the Chinese. And of course, it enabled, you know, for example, in the case of, of Venezuela, policies like, like those of, of Chavez, uh, uh, very radical mm -hmm. uh, policies. I don't know, I, I don't think that they did it deliberate, uh, you know, it was deliberate, yeah. But, yeah. but they, you know, uh, allowed Chavez to do what he did. So, so, so China basically providing an, an alternative uh, a, a allowed for that nationalism to, to really flourish, combined combined with uh, the I guess the, the largesse that was permitted during 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 the during the the uh, the, the, the Chavez years. years. Um, I, I want to zoom in. I'm going to bring everybody now into this conversation because I want to zoom in on, on, on Venezuela and I want to uh, ask you. Uh, there's a um, uh, get out your phones. Uh, it's not an app. It's just on a website. And the website is poll p o l l e v backslash f f ROE, uh, it should be up there, FFROE998. Um, and this is, this is our, our first question. Uh, uh, speakers, you can, you can feel free to participate as, as well. Um, uh, I'm going to really test your knowledge. Uh, but I, I want to zoom in. Um, and if anyone, um, again, is poll EV uh, backslash FFROES998. Uh, and that's the link to answer this qu first question. And, and this first question is, is, is zooming in on Venezuela. And, I, and we're going we're, to start off with this conversation with, with oil, which places front and center in, in Venezuela's economy and its relations with China. And, and Alejandro, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to help us understand what has been happening in Venezuela's oil industry. But I want to pose this, this question first, which, uh, which, is, which is the extent of, 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 the, uh, of the country's uh, estimated production. See, get, get, gauge the, the, the knowledge of, our, of the audience. Uh, I'll say by December 2018, uh, and I'm purposely using an old number. Uh, so by December 2018, Venezuela's production had collapsed uh, to 1.2 million barrels a day. Uh, which is about half of 2015 levels. And so questions given the current country's current conditions, what is Venezuela's estimated production in 2020? Uh, the choices are either between 850 to 1 million barrels, 600 to 850,000 barrels, 420 to 600,000 barrels, or, uh, or none of the above. Uh, it looks like um, uh, the overwhelming majority uh, have, have chosen uh, the correct uh, Correct question, uh, or the correct answer to the, to the question, which is between 420 and 600. Uh, so this is a uh, informed audience as we move forward in, in the discussion. <coughs> Venezuela's oil production in 2020 is likely to slide between this 420 and 600,000. Um, it's currently um, in September, actually, the latest number is about 644,000 barrels, uh, which is down an additional actually 82,000 barrels from uh, even August uh, 727,000 level. So 
picking up on, on that and, and realizing there, I guess there are a few, few folks, uh, even after I've given the answer, that think it might be actually between 850 uh, and a million barrels uh, in, 20, in 2020. Um, I want to start the conversation with, uh, and drill down Alejandro more on oil, which places front and center of Venezuela's economy and its relations with China. Uh, as, we, as we know, as we're showing on the screen, Venezuela's oil production has collapsed uh, to levels that are incomprehensible, levels that we never, we never, we never could have even imagined, frankly, even, even a year ago. As, as a director of Panavista, could you share what, 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 with us what, what, has, what, has been, what is the current state of Venezuela's oil industry um, and, uh, and, and how you view the, how you view the, the uh, uh, the, the ability of Venezuela to produce at this current moment. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to the Atlantic Council, uh, uh, Mark, for, your, for all your help. Uh, uh, two things, no? The, the first one is that the oil production has collapsed, okay? And has collapsed something that is very important even before the sanctions. Okay, from 2014, and I will use a, a slightly different uh, a source that is the PDVSA official figures, from 2014, in the hands of, of, of Maduro, PDVSA used to produce, or Venezuela used to produce, 2.9 million barrels per day, and that production has collapsed to 1.5 million barrels per day, okay, as of December. Again, there is difference between secondary sources and PDVSA sources. I mean, basically, Venezuela has collapsed almost 50%, okay, of their own production before coming the old sanctions, okay, a, a back of January this year. Of course, with the sanctions, the rate of collapsing oil production has increased, and we have lost, according to PDVSA again, from 1.5 million barrels per day to 750,000 barrels per day. So say here, the, in my opinion, the crisis has a very clear name. It's Nicolás Maduro, the one who is responsible for the collapse in the oil production. I need to say, and I am not trying to defend his, his predecessor, that during the Hugo Chavez regime, he was able to maintain the rate of decline in oil production in Venezuela with Hugo Chavez was something similar to 20, 25 million barrels per day, with Maduro is 375,000 barrels per day per year, okay, in the, in the size of the, of, of the collapsing in the oil production. So, so this is something that will not stop, okay, until Maduro is out of, of the office, and we are expecting that if Maduro, and you have two answer rights on your question, if Maduro do not outsit in 2020, I will expect that the oil production could reach something near 450,000 barrels per day. But here in the audience, there is 12% <laughs> mm. that believe, okay, that maybe Maduro will be out of power uh, at the end of this year and that we can have a recovery, or it is possible to have a recovery of 12% or, or to a level of 1 million barrels per day uh, uh, for 2020. Alejandro, I want to pick up one point you made, which is, which is that, that Chavez was able to better manage uh, the decline in the in, in oil output than, than Maduro, even, even before the, the broader uh, uh, U.S. sanctions took, took effect. What, drill down a little bit more on that. What, what's, the, what's the reason behind that? No, I, I, I basically, I mean, the, the, the one, when we see the figures, and for me it was, it, it, when we see the, uh, the historical analysis, okay, behind the, the oil production in Venezuela, at the end, also that Chavez made a lot of mismanagement on the oil industry. Also he fired like 40% of, of, of the principal key managers on the, on, the, on, on the oil industry. Maybe for the price of the oil was so big, maybe the resources that Venezuela received, okay, uh, uh, on the oil price was that, um, was that big that at the end they was able to maintain oil production. I believe that the, that the problem start to, germ, uh, uh, to start inside PDVSA, that, that, that it happened to explode during the Maduro administration, okay? But when we see the figures of how uh, uh, Chavez was able to maintain the oil production dur during 13 years and how the mismanagement of Maduro regime did in the last five years is basically to highlight that Maduro was even worse than that, that Chavez uh, uh, at that moment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, uh, Venezuela should be producing 5 million barrels of oil, and during the oil boom, Venezuela, uh, uh, if you see the production of OPEC without Venezuela and Venezuelan production, you know, OPEC production went up very significantly. Venezuelan production declined, as he said, during uh, Chavez regime. And Chavez had two things at the same time. 
the largest recorded windfall, you know, in the history of Latin America and in the, in the, in the oil industry, but also because of price, but also he had 1.1 million barrels of additional capacity that came from the oil opening done by the previous administration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so in, in that sense, Chavez policy was disastrous, but Maduro not only was worse, but on top of that, he had the decline in the price of oil and eventually sanctions. The only other thing I would add, obviously, you know, we've seen the economic mismanagement, the the, the uh, inability to maintain the facilities, um, uh, the departure of technical workers as part of some of this mass migration that we've seen because of the Maduro regime. Um, but there's another answer, which is theft. I mean, we've seen the, the theft from these these resources all the time. This is why the U.S. has targeted, mm -hmm. you know, the, the um, oil sector, the mining sector. Where are we seeing the Maduro regime steal the natural resources of the Venezuelan people? That is where we will target our sanctions. And so a huge reason for, uh, for the collapse is because the money was not being reinvested in the infrastructure. It was lining the pockets of the Maduro regime. And we see it not just in the oil sector. I mean, obviously, the ec uh, electric grid also suffers hugely from from the mismanagement of the Maduro regime um, and, and that and that theft helps per, the perpetuation of the Maduro regime those yeah. the, that does that elicit elicit uh, uh, access to, to, to financing I, I want to go back to uh, we're gonna go back to oil but first uh, Anne, I want to bring you back in uh, on, on relations between China and Venezuela which uh, developed exponentially uh, under under the under the uh, uh, under the under under Hugo Chavez, um, could you provide a, an overview of the growing Chinese p economic and political ties, uh, um, the growing uh, Venezuela China U.S. Uh, uh, sorry China Venezuela economic and political ties that have that have grown over the course of the of the last twenty years, and maybe also some additional context of of, of why why those the, why those grew so exponentially. Sure. So prior to Chavez the relationship between Venezuela and China was almost non-existent. I mean, trade between the two countries was less than half a billion dollars. And then after Chavez came to power, uh, so from like 1999 to 2013, uh, it just grew exponentially, like 24-fold in terms of trade and investment between the two countries. Chavez basically wanted to pivot away from the U.S. when he came to power and flew to Beijing multiple times to court the Chinese for investment and for diplomatic relations and, uh, and even military aid. And so, uh, so the two countries became extremely close during his reign. And after he passed away and Maduro stepped into power, uh, China basically remained a friend of Venezuela um, through sort of thick and thin. Uh, mostly because China also, besides just oil investments in Venezuela, made many other investments in Venezuela, including building a cell phone factory there, helping Venezuela launch a satellite, uh, building lots of housing projects for Venezuela, uh, mining projects. So it was a whole host of investments in Venezuela, uh, in addition to oil, that sort of cemented this relationship. and. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the Chinese view that anything that goes on in a country is their business. So uh, as we've seen in China's interactions with uh, authoritarian governments in Africa, like even if uh, it's against the wishes of you know, the population, the Chinese will still deal with the leaders because they feel, well, this is the official person that we should deal with. And so they just see all that as sovereignty and therefore don't make those distinctions about democracy versus authoritarianism because they're not pushing their ideology or not pushing their way of governance on anyone. They just want to do business deals, try to improve uh, you know, economic situations for both countries and, and they just have that very simplistic lens they apply. And so uh, in the case of Venezuela, I think that, and I said this in, a, in our breakfast meeting, um, as opposed to the way the U.S. Uh, approaches foreign policy, which is we don't have permanent friends, only permanent interests. The Chinese see permanent friends as permanent interests and therefore is more likely to stick with a country through thick and thin. Uh, you know, China has been known to have a long-term view about things. Uh, this applies to international relations as well. 
And so it's likely that even if Venezuela turns out to be a losing proposition for them, economically speaking, certainly during the short and medium term, uh, China's probably still going to uh, stick around, provide whatever humanitarian aid to Venezuela as they're going through this crisis. Uh, China has already been airlifting humanitarian aid to them. They've also moved a hospital ship in the region uh, in case violence breaks out. So, um, so in that sense, they basically, uh, you know, continue the support there. And, and, the, and the Chinese interest as well, and your point on, on it being beyond the oil industry, housing, satellite, uh, mining, um, that's also part of China's broader strategy on trying to kind of re release the, the pressure valve within China, right? As, as, as growth has accelerated so much within China, trying to find new uh, markets uh, for uh, Chinese labor and for Chinese in investments around the world. And Venezuela had historically provided such, such a market. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's certainly not just Venezuela. We've seen China make other technological and infrastructure investments in other Latin American countries, as well as places in Southeast Asia and Africa, too. Um, China basically, you know, has a lot of uh, extra capacity at this point in their manufacturing and, you know, a lot of industrial uh, capacity that they can export. Uh, to other countries. They also have a lot of resident technical expertise that they feel that they could share with developing nations. And so uh, they are seeing this as a way where they can provide, uh, you know, the best of what they can offer in return for uh, the commodities that they so sorely need. Um, and, and this is, you know, a, a very creative way of dealing with uh, helping these nations, given that most uh, developed nations, the Western countries, you know, it, we many of the investors would not go in to a lot of these places because, from a conventional standpoint, uh, they just don't see an investment payoff mm -hmm. uh, in the traditional timelines that investors look at, and so uh, and so a lot of these nations had been. Um, deficient in a lot of basic infrastructure needs that China has provided through, um, you know, exporting their extra capacity. And I, want, I want to pick up there, on, I think, an important point that you also you, 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 you snuck in there, Anne, as well, which is the time horizon, right? The China's time horizon of how they look at whether it's their investments or their strategic relationships are very different from how uh, 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 the, probably the rest of the region, uh, the United States, and, and others look at, look at time horizons, right? And that China is very much, I, I think, they're probably in the midst of that. Uh, there's already a 2050 plan, probably starting to think about the 2100 plan in, in, in the next few years. And so it's a very different horizon. I, I want to go back and ask another question uh, to um, Gate before moving on specifically to China and the oil industry. I, I want to ask a question um, uh, that'll uh, for, for everyone in the audience, uh, which is which is you get your thoughts on on what do you, what do people in the audience see as the percent of total Chinese lending in Latin America uh, that goes to uh, that goes to Venezuela. Uh, for reference, Venezuela historically accounts for about three percent uh, of of Latin American and Caribbean GDP. But what percent of chi total Chinese lending in Latin America uh, goes to goes to Venezuela? Uh, the, the answers are uh, twenty percent, forty percent, sixty percent, or does eighty percent of Chinese lending uh, go? Uh, go to Venezuela uh, from across the region. Give people a moment to answer that. I also told Francisco I would not ask because he came in here from Houston, uh, who's going to win game one of the World <laughs> Series uh, tonight. So that, that will not appear in the poll um, uh, because I think the answers might differ across the panel here. So it looks, it looks like the, um, the, the most 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 are answering B. Uh, I can't see the exact numbers. Fifty some odd percent uh, looks like uh, are answering B, uh, followed by uh, which is forty percent, uh, and then twenty percent and sixty percent, uh, but maybe forty percent followed by twenty percent followed by sixty percent. 
and, and, a, a, and a couple of you, actually now nobody thinks, 80%. Uh, so actually the correct answer is, is, is 60%. 60% um, of total Chinese lending in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean uh, goes to Venezuela. So incredibly uh, important from the, from the lending perspective, at, at, least, at least historically, uh, which is a, a, frankly, it's a mismatch that shows that China has uh, an, an outsized interest uh, in Venezuela. Francisco, I want to uh, use that to, to pivot to you. Uh, China's significant interest in, in Venezuela's oil industry specifically, both as a, as a buyer and also as a, as a lender. Um, from 2007, 2017, uh, Beijing provided uh, more than $60 billion in financing to Venezuela. We can unpack exactly what that financing uh, was for and the extent to which it's, it's, it's outstanding. Uh, but, but again, uh, that financing to Venezuela is a significant component of its overall uh, uh, lending to, to the region. Uh, many of the details of these loan agreements uh, with Venezuela are uh, murky at best. Um, could you share some findings, share some of your findings? You've written a lot on uh, oil-backed lending to, to Venezuela. Um, what, what, how do you, what do you see as the as the as the as the um, as the, the genesis of that oil back lending? Uh, what is it actually? If you unpack it a little bit, what does that oil back lend, Chinese lending to Venezuela actually look like? Uh, let me start with with that. Sure. So, um, of course, it, it seemed to make a lot of sense that you know a country with uh, some of the largest oil resources in in, in the world that uh, you know during the largest uh, you know price boom in history that you can you could lend them you know uh, uh, money and it was backed by uh, the uh, exports that uh, particular uh, exports that Venezuela uh, uh, did to China it's important to notice that most of the loans went to the Venezuelan government to the bandes or to other entities not to PDVSA which is I think one of the biggest uh, you know uh, problems because uh, the money was not directed to reinvest in the capacity to repay then the loans. So, uh, you know, at the time, as I said, there were a, a million barrels of additional production that came on uh, in line, plus the uh, uh, price boom seemed to, you know, allow for that. Although it's important to notice that they never were exposed to the $60 uh, billion, but because it was a rotating uh, uh, line of credit, um, at most, uh, you know, uh, probably half of it, uh, and, and today is between, you know, 15, 16 billion dollars uh, outstanding. But there is a, a, that average that you mentioned there is like the average, you know, temperature in the moon that it's, uh, uh, it's nice. But, you know, in the last, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the previous period between uh, 2010 and 2013, 60, two thirds of the Chinese loans to Latin America went to Venezuela. In the last few years, less than 20% have gone to Venezuela. So you see a very significant uh, uh, shift in policy, trying to reduce the uh, risk exposure to Venezuela, a very significant learning in the sense that now the, the, the money goes to uh, for oil or mining or something really the, uh, that generates capacity uh, uh, to repay. And um, there is also, uh, uh, you know, the realization that there might be regime change and, mm -hmm. and as a result, you know, they, they, they don't want to uh, be uh, um, uh, do, to risk uh, that as much as, as they did. Venezuela started defaulting when the price of oil went down in 2014, started defaulting on China. They, you know, <coughs> had to be sending about half a million barrels and they started not being, uh, uh, you know, uh, because they needed cash, they wanted to send uh, oil elsewhere to India or, or, or other places. Uh, the U.S., the, you know, they, they Venezuela increased exports to the U.S. for a while because they wanted cash. But the 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 thing is that uh, uh, you know China gave them a, a two-year um, grace period, uh, but then you know th they said, well, the price of oil has gone slightly up, and you know you need to repay us back. Um, the average uh, during this year has been about 300,000 barrels uh, sent to China. Uh, but recently, there, there it seemed to be declining. Uh, it's hard to know because China is imp uh, also importing, for example, uh, uh, oil from Malaysia that seems to be from Venezuela, blended in Malaysia, and then sent back uh, uh, to China. But CNPC announced that they are not going to be, you know, buying uh, Venezuelan uh, oil anymore. So there are some recent developments that point to uh, uh, um, increasing difficulty in paying the loans back. 
Alejandro, before I turn to you, Francisco, to follow a question. I mean, Francisco, how, what would you assess as, as the extent of China's, uh, the extent to which China is a, is a central player in Venezuela's declining oil industry today? Yeah, well, you know, particularly one project, Sinovenza, is a very important project. There are three, uh, you know, players in the Venezuela, foreign players in the Venezuelan oil industry, basically, today. Uh, Russia, China with CNBC, and Chevron uh, from the U.S. And in the case of, of uh, Sinovenza, that project was a very profitable project for a while. Uh, but lately, since this is a blending project with, you know, extra heavy oil with uh, a diluents, Venezuela doesn't have any more, you know, light production to the, f f as a diluent. They have to import it. It's increasingly costly because, you know, the U.S. is not selling it. Uh, so that project is, uh, uh, that project that was supposed to be expanded from a, about 110,000 barrels to 165,000 barrels, that expansion ha has been stopped. And so they are not making, I think, any you know uh, uh, profits uh, right now on 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 Venezuela. I mean, they still, of course, are interested because of the repaying of the debt. Uh, but it, it has been a, a significant, and there are other minor projects, but that that's uh, you know the uh, the big one. China is posed less than, by the way, than Russia. But China is posed if there is a transition, uh, and the oil industry recovers. Uh, China is supposed to, to, to uh, you know, significantly profit from that in the sense that there will be tremendous opportunities for expansion of, of those projects. And they do have some other blocks in Venezuela that could quickly, you know, start expanding production. So, uh, you know, there is some upside for yeah. them uh, uh, if that's the, the so, case. So, so current state right now, l le less, less interest, less uh, direct benefits for China, but a, but a, a potential, tr but China is basically set up uh, for incredible gains in Venezuela uh, in, a, in a transition given the blocks of the US. Yeah. Uh, Alejandro, um, please go ahead. I want to have you add to Francisco's analysis, but also ask you a, a follow up question uh, uh, through your role uh, on, on, on the, uh, with, with PDVSA, uh, which is wh what do you see as the interim government's also uh, uh, plan, whether short, medium, or long term, uh, for commercial engagement with China in the oil sector specifically? Yeah, uh, let me, uh, first I want to reinforce two ideas that Francisco Monaldi says. No? The first one is that the country with the biggest oil import in the world, that is China, need to have a strategic relation, long-term relation, with the biggest reservoir okay, of oil, or one of the biggest reservoirs of oil, uh, outside, outside the Middle East. And this is very important to have in mind. And the second one is that we have receiving a lot of signals okay, that China is retreating okay, from Venezuela. There is no new money coming to Venezuela. There is no new investment coming to Venezuela. There are new loans. There are not new loans coming to Venezuela. Venezuela is basic, basically paying the loans, the previous loan in a rate of $3 billion okay, a year eh, 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 to China. And this is very important, in my opinion, to put in mind eh, eh, what, what, eh, where we are as of today. No? The second thing is that we build a program, a, 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 an oil program for the day after. This program was built by the best oil expert, uh, Venezuelan oil expert, that basically have different numbers and different uh, 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 and one conclusion. We can, pro we can increase oil production. This was a program that was built from the oil field. Basically, we look each of the oil fields, try to see all the, the financial needs or all the capital investment that they need all the operational investment that they need and how much was the potential in terms of oil production that we can receive in the in each of the oil field and we build up and we finish with a with a national program for the day after this national program in in the rough term is able to increase oil production in 2.2 million barrels per day in seven years this oil program it, it will need new investment of 120 billion dollars okay in capex it needs $70 billion in OPEX. And there is several conclusions of that. First one, Venezuela alone cannot do it. We need to change the, 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 some type of, uh, of the hydrocarbon law in order to accept a biggest part of investment from the private oil sector and from the international oil sector. Second one, my opinion, there is a space for everybody. It's not just that, that Russia or China. We need more Russia, more China, more for this oil program, to develop this oil program. We need also, of course, much more U.S. investment also there. We are talking of $190 billion in seven years. This is almost $25 billion per year, mm. okay? This is the, the amount that we need in order 
to reestablish the oil production in 2028, the oil production that we have in 2014. So in that sense, we believe and we are of the opinion that we have a place and a space for everybody. And, and what, do you, what do you see, Alejandro, as far as uh, 10 years from now, uh, the potential oil output in Venezuela? The potential, potential oil, oil output, output, it will be something near 3 million barrels per day. That is the amount that we used to have back in, in, in 2014, 2013. Uh, Kerry, I want to complement this with, with your perspective um, about the, um, China's role in, in Venezuela uh, more, more broadly. Um, and, and how critical you see Chinese support being for sustaining the, the Maduro regime? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, we're, we're spending a lot of time on the oil side, on the economic piece, um, and that is one significant piece that we've seen historically. But as, as Francisco and Alejandro raised, it's really something that we're seeing a, a retreat from on, on China's side. So what are the other things that, that China is doing to enable the Maduro regime? And I would put it in two key categories in addition to the economic one. The first one is social control. Um, they're doing this in, in two primary ways. First of all, we, we, we know that um, China is exporting surveillance technology, which helps with repressing the, the Venezuelan people. Um, this includes the CLAP program, which utilizes a national ID card that people can um, use in order to get food, but it's obviously tied to uh, their political loyalty. Uh, this is Chinese technology. Um, so there's social control that, um, that the Chinese have, have contributed. And also, of course, there's surveillance. Um, which is making sure that um, the, the Venezuelan people can't really communicate with each other. Um, they, they have a sense that they are constantly being surveilled by both the, the Cubans and the Chinese and aren't able to um, really organize in an effective manner the way we typically see in countries that are, that are fighting an illegitimate government. Um, and then the, the, the second major element is international support and providing a sense of international legitimacy to the Maduro regime. We saw this most recently um, uh, during the uh, Human Rights Council vote. Now, everybody with a pulse knows that Venezuela has no business being on the Human Rights Council. It is, the, it is under active investigation by the Human Rights Council for significant human rights violations. A, a fact-finding mission was recently authorized by the Human Rights Council against the Venezuelan regime. So the fact that they've now been elected is just a, it, it's just a, a restatement of why the United States ultimately had to leave from the Council, because it doesn't actually protect human rights. It, it really allows those countries that want to undermine them to use the Council for that explicit purpose. Purpose. But the Chinese were very vocal in support of the Venezuelan government being elected to the council. The Chinese were very vocal in trying to prevent Guaido's representative to the IDB to participate in those meetings. So we're seeing the Chinese take a very political role when it comes to support for the Maduro regime. And that's something that's very significant as well as we try to counter that with our you know, 56 countries that recognize the interim president. And a fault to that. I mean, on, on surveillance technology, international logistics, have we seen this? Have we seen this bear out with regard to Chinese China's policy in, in other countries ar around the world? Um, certainly, people have said that China uh, is providing surveillance technology to countries part of the Belt and Road across the Eurasian continent. So, um, so sure, I'm sure that China is exporting. Uh, that technology as well as many other technologies. Uh, and I think that they don't see a problem with that because they see that the U.S. uses surveillance technology, the U.K. uses surveillance technology to a great extent. So um, I guess they just don't see them as being an outlier in terms of exporting um, this kind of technology. And, uh, and like I said, they view peace and stability as like a, you know, a very core value and so they think that if they are helping governments maintain peace and stability in their regions that that is actually great for economic growth because if you know there is uncertainty if there you know protests turn into chaos and violence as what's happening in Chile right now you know they think that that hurts everybody and so I guess that's their rationale okay. for for doing this. And so, Karen, I want, I want to go go back to you and, 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 and ask you a follow-up question. You can you can um, feel free to, to respond to uh, um, the, the Chinese perception uh, of, of the of surveillance technology. But also, what do you think is our possible steps 
to then reduce Chinese uh, support for Maduro, because that's ultimately what we're trying to get at here, right? How do we actually reduce Chinese support uh, for Maduro, but also what in, in may in fact backfire? What actually would increase China's support for, for the regime? Sure. Um, so just to, just quickly in response to what Anne laid out, I mean, I think obviously we actually, there is something that we share with the Chinese, which is that we also agree that peace and stability is a primary driver of economic growth. This is precisely why the Maduro regime has seen such an economic collapse and has seen, you know, the departure of 4.5 million refugees. Um, you know, it, it's it's why it's seen a, a 24 percent, uh, you know, constriction of their of their GDP over over the last year and 50 percent right before that. It's one of the worst economic collapses that we've ever seen. And so if a country is really committed to peace and stability, then certainly support for the Maduro regime, which is the, the cause of the humanitarian suffering, the cause of the political suffering and the cause of the economic collapse w would be a nonsensical policy choice. And so when you when you ask, you know, what can we do to help um, you know, change the, the, the Chinese perspective. Um, first of all, I think there's one opportunity here, which is that the Chinese leadership is primarily transactional. And what I mean by that is not only transactional in an economic sense, I also mean transactional in a political sense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you look at it from a political sense, I think one of the things is, is understanding that their relationship that is at stake here is not just their relationship with Venezuela. It is a relationship with the broader region. Um, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, the entire region um, has started to unite in support of interim President Guaido. Um, and if they are able to tie the Chinese behavior in Venezuela to their relationships with China, I think that will increase the cost on the, on the Chinese in a way that, that could be very useful in, in changing their perspective. Um, there's also just naturally, you know, we were talking about how the Chinese have a longer term perspective. Well, if that's true, then they need to understand that over the long term, uh, there are very few people that, that will look at Nicolas Maduro and say, this is a guy who's competent, intelligent, and can successfully run a country. Even in the short term. Uh, even in the short term. <laughs> so when you look at that and you say, okay, well, I want peace and stability. You know, I want a strong economy. I want to tie my interests to what is one of the largest oil reserves in the world. Then taking a long-term approach, you will say, I should not be putting all of my eggs in Maduro's basket. Mm -hmm. um, and so the closer we can get towards making it obvious that a transition is imminent, I think the closer we will get to the Chinese shifting their calculus as well. And I think they also understand that all of these contracts that they had negotiated with the former regime, those have not been agreed to by the National Assembly. They are not valid under Venezuelan law. And so in a moment of transition, if the Chinese leadership does not actively participate and negotiate with the Guaido government and have conversations with the Guaido government, then those contracts are very much at risk. And I think they understand that as well. So we can benefit from the fact that they're transactional and they're long-term thinkers in order to uh, move them closer to a position of, of supporting the legitimate government in Venezuela, as long as we can make it clear that we're, we're nearing that transition point. Very, very helpful. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. Yeah, please. I, I, yeah, oh, please. Okay. So I guess the reason why the Chinese government is kind of tolerating uh, Maduro's incompetent governance is because they probably see some of that in themselves, right? Because China's early years during the Great Leap Forward was a complete disaster, right? They had famine. It was, you know, their economy was practically in collapse as well. So, but they were able to turn it around themselves while maintaining the mm -hmm. same leadership, you know, and consistency. And so I think that is what they're hoping that the Venezuelan government will do. And, um, and do it internally as opposed to having outside pressure. Uh, very, very good, very good insight. Thank you, thank you, Ann. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to uh, bringing everybody in the audience uh, into, the, into the discussion. I wanna ask you a, a, a question, which I'm very interested to hear people's uh, uh, thoughts. This is uh, not, a, not a right or wrong question. It's a more of a analysis of all, all of you, which is, do you believe China can play a constructive role toward a peaceful and democratic transition in Venezuela? Simple yes or no question. Um, not sure. Or not sure, <laughs> sorry, There's, or not sure. Um, uh, so it's not as simple as I laid out. Um, and, and we're gonna keep drilling out John on this question, but I'm interested to see people's thoughts thus, thus far. So uh, looks like thus far, um, about half of you think that China can play a constructive role. Um, if I'm looking at things as 42%, uh, 
uh, and then the the uh, the other re the rest of the group is is split between either no or not sure, um, but not sure or no. So let, let's let's um, we I'll give you a preview. We might come back to that question at the end, and let's see what those what those uh, responses are are at the at the end. Um, and I want to I want to follow up, um, Carrie. You mentioned uh, both. Uh, how do you how do you reduce support? And one is showing the regional implications of uh, of China's growing support for, of China's continued support for Venezuela. Also uh, showing that that transition is imminent, right? Uh, among among other things. Um, moving on to looking at kind of great power competition in, in Venezuela and further further joined on on that question. And 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 you 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 were just you're mentioning about the very insightful comments on, on the Great Leap Forward, but also how how do you see how much of a priority relative to its global foreign policy agenda is the Venezuela crisis for for the Chinese government? How 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 much of a priority is it that frankly that that, that, that Beijing gets it right? How critical is that um, uh, back for the for for, for uh, uh, kind of the the, the power and, and the support that the government has within its own country? Right, so I think if China had to look at all the issues on their plate, um, Venezuela would fall somewhere maybe in the middle. Top priorities for China will always be its own sovereignty internationally, so they care more about Taiwan, Hong Kong, South China Seas, things that are close to home um, and that, you know, part of their integrity as a country and Venezuela doesn't fall in that category per se. Um, so from that standpoint, um, you know, Venezuela is not a top priority. And then secondly, we know that the output of oil is also uh, been dwindling. So clearly they're not relying on Venezuela for oil at this point. Um, so that's not necessarily critical to their uh, growth and consumption resources. Uh, but like I said, uh, they are not willing to step away from friends that easily. Uh, they tend to uh, value relationships. And so it would take a lot to convince China to, uh, you know, completely uh, flip their relationship with Venezuela. And I would say that part of the reason is that they feel this is probably another potential flashpoint with the U.S. geopolitically. And so uh, to the extent that the U.S. continues to supply military aid to Taiwan, uh, they feel that maybe they need a beachhead uh, in the U.S. backyard um, as a tit for tat geopolitically speaking. And so uh, while it's not top of priority, I don't think that they're going to ignore it, mm -hmm. which is why I said that they have um, provided that assistance to Maduro uh, because it doesn't make much economic sense, obviously. So it has to be more from a geopolitical standpoint. <clears throat> Alejandro, I want to direct a similar, similar, similar question to you, which is you, you, you've, we've been discussing over the course of the, of the, of the, uh, of the panel, the level of Chinese investment in the Venezuelan oil industry um, uh, dwindling. Um, uh, and and uh, my question goes for you is also, what do you see, especially from the, from an oil perspective, uh, oil hat, uh, is what would be critical for uh, shifting uh, 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 Chinese support for, for the Maduro regime? What, what would be some, some triggers uh, uh, potentially that, that would prompt uh, that, that change in, in, a Chinese, uh, in Chinese support, specifically uh, further reducing its, um, its support for uh, maintenance of, of its investments in the oil sector? Yes, uh, uh, I would say two things. No? First, I, I fully agree of the challenge and the signal that we are receiving from China. Okay, as Carrie say, we are still receiving negative signal at the United Nations uh, uh, with the choose of, or, or, or with the wing of, of President uh, uh, of, of Nicolas Maduro, the seat of the, of the Human Rights Council. We also know that we are part of this geopolitical game between China and the U.S. But, but I need to say that I, I am still confident and positive that China could be more part of the solution rather than of the problem. And I also believe that we are very actively, you know, trying, we as the a, a Guaido team, very actively, actively trying to open, okay, a back, cha a, a back channel, a communication channel, a formal channel 
with China in order to start to reduce any any mistrust that that, that could happen between the Guaido uh, uh, administration and the and the Chinese administration. We are looking again to have a partner that could fully invest in Venezuela. I fully agree with Francisco who say that that if in the recovery of the oil industry, China will will have a lot of profit, okay, uh, uh, and could fully develop the investment that they have right now there. Uh, uh, and that we need to try to continue pushing them, okay, to come to this field, to be part of the solution, to try to build the transition that, that all Latin America, not just Venezuela, have. Uh, and we need to be very clear, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, that the signaling that China is giving, also inside the, the geopolitical one, the signaling that China is giving to Latin America, with the supporting of, of, of Maduro, of the regime, or Nicolas Maduro is, is costing them, okay, also in terms of new investment and in terms of the future of the region. Of the region. Francisco, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to, to jump in there as well. Um, and also ask you, Francisco, what do you see as so far as um, the, the effects of Venezuela-related Venezuela -related sanctions? Um, and how what, what, what have been some of the, the main implications of those sanctions toward the Maduro regime? But also, how have they potentially impacted uh, Chinese operations uh, in Venezuela? Sure. I, I wanted to, you know, first reinforce uh, what Alejandro said in terms of, you know, the massive potential of investment that there's going to be in the future and the bad experience that CNPC and uh, other uh, Chinese players have had in, in, in Venezuela. Uh, in terms of the sanctions, uh, particularly the more, uh, you know, recent uh, uh, threat of secondary sanctions has, has had some impact. You know, CNPC has announced that they are not continued uh, their contract of uh, buying oil, uh, at least for now. They, they didn't say permanently, but uh, they are clearly assessing uh, uh, the situation. Uh, um, Sino um, Sinopec uh, said that they are not hiring uh, any vessel that, that had been in Venezuelan ports uh, uh, in the last uh, few months or even, I think, more than a year. Uh, which Exxon similarly did, by the way, but but the Chinese are clearly, you know, worried about uh, the effect of uh, of secondary sanctions. It's still unclear. Uh, how much oil is going to continue to flow to, to China. Um, you know, as I said, we, we in the first f uh, half of this month, we, we see less uh, direct uh, shipping of oil from Venezuela to China. But, you know, it's unclear how much goes sort of uh, uh, in alternative yeah. way through Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, you know, the Russia is marketing, as I said, two thirds of the Venezuelan oil. So. Um, it, it's sometimes uh, hard to track. Uh, some oil is actually go surplus oil is going to Cuba more than th what they need. So, uh, one a very important uh, uh, element to, to notice is that for the first time, the restriction is not production. Venezuela uh, used to be, uh, you know, the declining production, but able to sell that production. Now inventories are, uh, uh, you know, absolutely full. Uh, they, they are, uh, it's very hard to find a tanker now to have, you know, uh, inventory outside of, of, of land. And the, because of lack of maintenance, Venezuelan capacity to, uh, um, you know, the tanks uh, on land are, are, is very much reduced. So they are starting to be in a, in a situation in which that's one of the reasons why they started sending oil to Cuba or mm -hmm. even they're paying e and I a debt that they, did, they, they didn't want to pay because they have oil that they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot sell. So in that sense, the, the secondary sanctions and uh, are, I think are, are, are working. As you say, storage facilities are basically maxed out, uh, maxed Correct. out in Venezuela, and so the, this Venezuela, the oil that is being produced, uh, is just is basically, uh, my understanding is, is just is sitting on tankers. Exactly, um, and, and, and there is uh, it's very hard to to find you know additional tankers to have floating inventory, uh, which of course is also costly. Right. Um, so uh, I think that strategy is reaching to 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 its limits, and and and, and if they start to to have to close, uh, you know, production. Uh, that will be also very costly because it's very hard to to restart some of that production in Venezuela. So, so the answer to the question is that is how to what extent they impacted Chinese operations? Well, they've pre it's, it's prevented China from actually uh, from 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 moving Venezuelan oil uh, be 
you know, off its, off its tankers and, and from uh, uh, f facilitating greater investment. It's making it much harder. is making CNPC very careful, which is the, the official, you know, company that most of the, 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 the loan repayment mechanism works through. And by the way, they stopped uh, uh, the, the uh, you know, they, they're gonna, they were going to expand the expansion of Sinovenza. It has been stopped, mm -hmm. uh, which was a very important project. Kerry, I want to I want to ask you um, as we're, as we're move, shifting for a moment from oil, and, th and then I'm going to uh, uh, ask another question to, to all of you in the in the audience. Uh, and there will actually be time for for a traditional question and answer as well. So don't 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 fret. Uh, but Kerry, is there is there a red line for Chinese involvement in the Venezuela crisis from from the U.S. perspective? I mean, we've we've been, we've been talking extensively about kind of what the status quo is is, is, is right now um, and how China's priorities could or couldn't shift in, in, in the direction which, in which we, we hope that they shift, which is support of the interim government. But, but is, is there a, 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 a red line or, or a breaking point in which um, uh, certain actions or what type of actions could, would China take uh, that would be, uh, you know, t demand even greater response from the United States? Well, I think if you look at some of the ways in which we've responded in other scenarios, it kind of gives a sense of, of what we would think would be going too far. I mean, certainly anything that um, would uh, would be seen as sort of violating our sanctions would, of course, be a red line. Um, it's We are seeing a, a, a productive uh, shift in that, um, as, as Francisco laid out, we're seeing less of a sort of direct economic investment, which I think is really useful. Um, but you know, uh, the question of red line also gets to the, the political question and how much the, the political support that China provides to the Maduro regime is really emboldening and, and, and boosting him. And again, on the HRC vote, I think we saw, we were fortunate in that it was the lowest amount of votes in favor of any country in recent years. So I, I do want to lay that out. 105 votes is significantly fewer um, also than they had received in 2015. But the fact that you have a country like China, which also sits on the security Council, um, uh, you know, uh, supporting them is, is very problematic. So, another issue that would that would come to mind is if there were some kind of a, a negotiation between um, the Maduro regime and the interim government, um, and China somehow impeded that. Uh, mm -hmm. We have seen the Cubans and we have seen the Russians engage unproductively in terms of sort of these um, agreements that are being laid out. And so, if the Chinese started to engage in that capacity, I think that would be a, a red line too. I do want to quickly say, you know, one of the things that, that Anne had pointed out to at the very beginning is not just how we view the Chinese involvement, but also how how the Chinese view their own involvement, and they constantly will use the term of neutrality, right? Neutrality and non-interference. We also hear this often from, from the Caribbean. But I, I, I just want it to be very clear that silence in the face of evil, like Nicolas Maduro, is not neutrality. That's complicity, right? And so we need to be really clear about that point. And it's particularly being complicit when the relationship is su supporting surveillance technologies. That are using uh, that are being used to repress the population. It's particularly complicit when you are seeing the regime, because of the relationship, prioritize delivering payback oil, often to the tune of hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars over time, instead of prioritizing the distribution of food to to its own citizens. And it's particularly complicit when um, when it uses multilateral institutions to to bolster that regime. And so these are all things that we look at as well when we think about red lines: is the is the political implications of the of the Chinese support for Venezuela. Thank you. I want, I want to turn to a, a question um, back to you in the audience, and then after you answer, I'm going to have one more question with the panel, then to open up to, to traditional Q&A. Uh, but it's, it's a, um, how many Chinese and Russian uh, oil service firms do you believe are already operating uh, in Venezuela, and, uh, Venezuela at this moment? How many Chinese and Russian oil fir service firms are operating uh, in, in Venezuela? <laughs> Again, the, answer, the choices here are, are, are 50, uh, 20, uh, 150, or 600 Chinese and Russian oil service firms uh, operating in Venezuela. Looks like most of you think uh, 50, uh, which um, if you multiply that number by 12 times, you would be correct. <laughs> um, um, this is a, um, Russia has about 254 companies. This is from the Energy Intelligence Group. Russia has about 254 companies in Venezuela uh, performing oil, for oil field services, uh, the majority of which are subsidi subsidiaries of Rosneft. Uh, China has about 294 service firms on the ground, uh, which is primarily China off-field off services. 
uh, which is a, com and a comparison to about 60 U.S. 60 U.S. headquarters service firms uh, operating in Venezuela today. So uh, significant uh, uh, Chinese and Russian uh, oil service firms are currently operating. The majority of the, the more of which are are actually Chinese. Um, within that, and Karen, I'm going to ask you this question, then turn it over to you in the audience. Within that, Carrie. Um, U.S. companies that operate in Venezuela or might operate in Venezuela in, in a, in, after a, a transition, they face, will face or will face multiple challenges in a complex and also a deteriorating environment. So what, do you think, effect, uh, what extent do you think we should be concerned about eventually losing business opportunities uh, to China when the sit political situation actually allows uh, for renewed investment following a transition and eventual reconstruction? Or is it less about losing opportunities? Are there actual opportunities uh, for the U U.S. and China to actually work together uh, on business development eventually in Venezuela? Well, obviously, the long-term opportunities in Venezuela are profound because of their, um, the, you know, the size of their oil industry. Because of, you know, it was once the largest economy in the region, um, and so anybody who's taking a long-term approach, I think, recognizes that when there is a government that um, is focused on rehabilitating those facilities and that infrastructure, it's a really great opportunity either for the United States or for China or for Russia or for any number of countries that, that want to be involved. Um, I'm hoping that your your question is sort of a moot point in that we see a transition very, very quickly um, and don't have to, you know, really address the problem of if this is sort of a long-term scenario where we have Maduro continue to be in power. Um, but I do think, again, that the focus really is on that transition. I mean, the United States, when we talk about what our policy is in Venezuela, it is not merely to get Maduro out of power. Our policy in Venezuela has been very clear that it is free and fair elections and a stable, prosperous, um, and democratic Venezuela. Venezuela. So stable, prosperous, and democratic means that we are investing in the country over the long term. We are very focused on helping it um, with its stabilization. Um, we are working on plans for sort of day after scenario, which I know is really important to um, many of those in the audience here and of course to the, um, to the Venezuelan people. And so there are a number of opportunities that come out from, from those investments um, for both U.S. companies and others. And then just to, to sort of respond to your question about the U.S. and China, um, we are we, we continue to engage with the Chinese, obviously, on the question of Venezuela. Um, it's something that um, we've spoken with them about. Special Representative Abrams um, has, has met with the Chinese a number of times. And so we meet with them because there is an important opportunity. This is not a moment where we have to necessarily be at odds with each other. Um, you know, we do not have an entirely antagonistic relationship with the Chinese. Um, and so if there is a recognition that, OK, we see a transition coming, and the, and the Chinese leadership decides to not only follow the path that is right for them economically, but also follow the path that is right from a moral perspective, um, then, then I think we can, we can both have success in Venezuela. So, a, a, a great, great comments. I want to turn over to uh, the audience for your uh, questions, comments. Uh, I see uh, microphones are coming, coming your way. Uh, fourth row there, Tom. And we'll maybe you take a couple questions uh, together here. Yeah, if you could put name and affiliation. Yeah. Is this on? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I just want to point out uh, uh, that uh, I'm a, a project finance guy, as Jason knows, and I, I look at things uh, a little bit differently than the geopolitical spectrum. Uh, in oil production uh, projects, we talk about the finance in terms of upstream financing and downstream financing. And basically, upstream financing is everything that it takes to, to get the raw oil, whatever type it is, into a refinery, and then downstream is what it takes to get it from the refinery into your gas tank. Um, the issue becomes, as Kerry was talking about, I want to put a point on it, infrastructure. Uh, well, the problem that you have primarily when you look at, I believe, that infrastructure, and, and Alejandro, this goes directly to you as well, is that we want to talk about production of barrels of oil production, and it's a really, really, I think, bad statistical departure point to talk about Venezuela, because the issue in Venezuela is not how much oil can be produced. It's how much oil is free on board, on ships, that can be taken out. As Alejandro knows, Sitco just lost an entire shipload of oil because even though it was on the ship, they couldn't get it out. Okay, so the question becomes this. Um, 
yesterday, Forbes uh, put out a uh, put out an article that says Russia looks set to be buying Venezuela oil, like all of it, according to rumors in the market and one confirmed recently by Venezuelan daily El Nacional. Russia's state-owned oil giant, Rosnet, is going to take control of PDVSA, the bankrupt Venezuelan oil company, blah, blah, blah. Seems to me that that makes a lot of the discussion today overtaken by events. Okay. Uh, if, if, in fact, that happens, China has already said that they will only accept ship-to-ship -ship transfer oil uh, to pay, f pay off their debts. And unfortunately for us, when it comes to sanctions, this started when Igor Senchin from Rosnet, sanctioned up past his ears, uh, makes a trip to talk to Maduro about why is China getting more oil to pay their debt, which is less than the debt to Rosnet. So my question is, where are we going with infrastructure in Venezuela to pay anything? I certainly don't believe that 200, uh, that 2 billion is enough. You, you can't even begin to pump oil from the Orinoco belt for that because you don't have the electricity to heat it to get it to the port facilities, which are falling apart, uh, and, uh, you know, go from there. So Thank, thanks. I'd, like to hear, I'd, like to hear, I'd like to hear the panel discuss a little bit more where are we going with this whole infrastructure thing and how does that affect the payment? Okay, infrastru infrastructure, and then also the, the point on, on Russia, and maybe even the point of kind of geopolitical competition between Russia and, and China with regard to Venezuela's oil industry. Um, also, uh, yes, in the second to last row, uh, Freddie, right in the aisle there. Hi, excuse me. Um, I'm Emily Meredith. I'm a reporter with Energy Intelligence. And <coughs> Carrie, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the decision yesterday to reissue licenses for U.S. firms operating in Venezuela. Is this because you're concerned about giving Rosneft or Chinese firms um, more of an angle into Venezuela? You want to head that off? Um, and then second, there are huge debt payments coming due this weekend on Venezuela's most profitable asset. Um, in That's in the U.S., that's CITGO. Could the panelists talk a little bit about um, what the options are in terms of brokering negotiations, if there are steps the administration can take, things along those lines. Thanks. Great. Th thanks, Meredith. Um, let me actually just take those two. Those are two pretty uh, comprehensive questions. Let me turn back to the, to the panel on, the, on those questions, both uh, the infrastructure, and the geopolitical, but then also uh, the, 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 the extension of the, of the license uh, yesterday and the, and the pending debt payment. I'll start with you, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis. sure. I'll, I'll start with the, with the question about Rosneft. I mean, so first of all, Russia, um, I know that the Atlantic Council had had an event on Russia's engagement in Venezuela, and it is significantly uh, more problematic than, than the Chinese engagement. Um, you know, we are continuing to see more investment. We are continuing to see um, the creation of new contracts, particularly contracts um, for technical capacity, uh, for, for military equipment and capacity and so on, uh, negotiated between the Maduro regime and, and, um, and the Russians. Um, so that is something that uh, occupies uh, our attention on a daily basis. When it comes to um, the specific question about Rosneft, um, potentially taking control of Pedavis. I mean, I would just go back to once again, the argument that the Russians use, the argument that the Chinese use about sovereignty. So these countries that claim that they are uh, not interfering in, uh, in international affairs of other countries, in domestic affairs of other countries, are now saying that they may be interested in, um, uh, in taking control of Pedavesa, which is a n national Venezuelan asset. Um, if there are concerns about, you know, other entities being, you know, having, uh, being overtaken, I mean, th this is a real question of Venezuelan sovereignty. And so if this is really the directions that, that the Russians want to go in and they, they have not commented on it, and, and we have our own analysis as to whether or not we think it's, it's accurate, but um, I would say that they should be very concerned about how that dovetails with their position of non-interference non and how that would be interpreted not only by the Venezuelan people, but obviously by, by the region as a whole, which is very much focused on the question of sovereignty. Um, Emily, to your question about the licensing, um, this is actually also a, an issue of infrastructure too, so it's great that those questions were paired together. Um, the reality here is that when you talk about some of the um, 
uh, the, the entities that um, we have authorized to move forward, there's, there's two key points. Number one is these are not um, allowing any money to go back to uh, the, the regime. So that is the, the point of our sanctions, is to constrain the financial assets the Maduro regime has access to. And so the licenses that we have provide do not allow um, financial resources to go to the regime. And so it's very much consistent with our foreign policy. But it also adds on another thing that's important to our foreign policy, which is we need to consistently be aware of the day after scenario. We need to be aware that, as was mentioned, I, I, I think by Francisco, um, that if some of this infrastructure collapses, um, there could be a real challenge in terms of the amount of time that it takes to rehabilitate that infrastructure. Um, and so that was part of the thinking uh, here as well as to, as to why this is consistent with our foreign policy. Now, I can't judge whether or not you know, the analysis will shift over time, um, but certainly uh, the license was provided for the, for the next 90 days um, consistent with, with that uh, line of thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, I'll let you French. Um. Yes, no, I, I just want to take also the, 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 the claims that we are, that is under discussion in the public opinion right now. A, a Guaido administration is receiving a country with more or less $160 billion, okay, in heritage claim. Okay, we have almost 40 cases that we are fighting, that we are discussing in, in different courts. And the, the next one, the, 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 the one that is coming very soon, as soon as next Monday, is the one with the bondholder of the 2020. We want to reinforce the idea that, that we always want to negotiate all our claim, that we need to try to reach a solution, okay, with all the claimants, okay, but maybe, and Carrie knows very well that, that maybe we will need more time to, 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 to find the solution, and we were always trying to look to have, to, 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 to ask to the U.S. government, to the revoke the license number five as a way again to gain more times and to reach a solution and negotiate the solution with the bondholders. So we have different strategy. One will be looking for the revocation of the of the license number five. We are also trying to see okay a direct a, 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 a negotiation with the bondholders and we are doing that uh, as of today. And the, the final solution will be over a negotiation. There is a lot of claim, a lot of cases on the courts, and this is a difficult position for, for PDVSA and, of course, for, the, for Venezuela. Uh, and Francisco, I'll give you also the opportunity to respond to either one of those questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, China certainly has plenty of money they, they could put towards infrastructure and rebuilding infrastructure in Venezuela. Uh, the problem is, is that right now, because they're of this standoff that uh, between sort of a western back uh government versus the existing one. Um, China certainly feels that there has been a complete breakdown of trust with the U.S. given the trade negotiations and, and all the other things that have developed since the Trump administration has come into power. And I think that this is part of the difficulty of trying to um, you know, get China on board to say, oh, you know, if we have a transition, then you can certainly be part of the rebuilding. Um, they probably don't trust that. And so I think that is the biggest piece that's missing right now. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, uh, on the infrastructure, I believe the plan that Alejandro mentioned includes a very significant amount of investment in infrastructure and electricity, et cetera. 120 billion includes uh, uh, even environmental remediation and, and, and other issues like that. Ha having said that, and there is tremendous need for infrastructure investment, particularly, you know, electricity and others. Uh, you know, you have a lot of spare capacity also in some infrastructure because you have you have pipelines that you know used to produce uh, an export two million barrels of oil, and even though they are not well maintained, you have uh, you know have you have you are exporting now six hundred thousand. So in in some areas there is uh, there is significant spare capacity. On the Russia versus China sort of difference, you know, th there is a very significant difference here, right? One is the largest importer of oil in uh, in the world. The other country is an exporter of, of oil that only is in Venezuela for uh, uh, the reason that they were invited by a regime on very special uh, uh, conditions and they got a, a massive real estate in the oil industry that it, that, you know, that is very attractive and they, by the way they got in when the, Rus when the Chinese were uh, de-risking, were sort of reducing their exposure. 
and they have been a, a extremely smart at you know getting repaid, the getting control over the uh, Venezuelan oil industry. And I do agree that they, if if the, you know the Western companies leave, they might you know take take over. I don't think you know what what has been uh, speculated about you know taking uh, over PDVSA. I don't think it's probably true, but but they uh, but but de facto, you know, it's happening. Mm -hmm. you, you you need to call to uh, Roughneck in Panama if you want to buy Venezuelan oil. So you know, the, yeah. the, de facto, they are very much uh, in control. So, but but this is a very different story, I think. You know, from the uh, uh, from the Chinese uh, involvement in Venezuela. Finally, on the on the Citgo issue, I'm very concerned uh, because you know this is the only. Uh, uh, claimant that had uh, was left an opening, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the license uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, sanctions. So it puts them in a different, you know, uh, 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 status than everyone, uh, all, all the other claimants, and th therefore they have a tremendous leverage in, in negotiation. And the situation is, you know, very uh, it's extreme because yeah. it's very soon. So I hope the the, the U.S. government does. Uh, um, suspend the, that, that license giving time for a, for a meaningful uh, negotiation with, uh, 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 with these bondholders. I think, you know, think, think about it. This is, as Alejandro said, a country that owes, you know, claims for $160 billion. And uh, there is no such thing as a bankruptcy for a country, right? But there needs to be a negotiated, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, restructuring of all these claims in order to make Venezuela a be able to grow and to, you know, uh, as much as possible repay some of those uh, claims. If everyone can indulge me, I want, I want to just put up, we're, we're out of time, but I'm going to put up the, 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 last, the last question. I want to see how, how this panel did, uh, which is, do you believe China uh, can play a constructive role toward a peaceful and democratic uh, transition in, in Venezuela. Uh, when we first asked the question earlier, uh, it was, I think, about a third of you were, weren't sure. Uh, so we'll see after this discussion, uh, are you, it, 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 are, are more, okay. Oh, that's, uh, are people still unsure or, or, or is there- um, Fully divided. Uh, fu or fully divided between, between yes and, and no. Um, You're going to give us the answer. <laughs> Uh, I will give. I will try to. Give, and I, I will give the. I will show that the when we first asked this question earlier in the discussion, forty-seven percent of you thought yes, twenty-seven percent thought no, and twenty-seven percent thought not sure. Um, for those that are that are that are voting, um, this is we're, we're judging how well our, our panelists did and convincing you one way one way or another, at least reducing the number of of not sures. Um, also, as you're voting, I want to thank uh, Pepe Zhang and Christina Guevara, who put this uh, event together for their uh, excellent work, and, and also acknowledge uh, uh, the Deputy of the Center, Paula garcia Tufro, is here, does uh, such great work on, 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 uh, on this portfolio, and among other things, and, and Diego Arreo, who's here as well, who manages our Venezuela work. Uh, the, the answer here, oh, we, we switched. <laughs> to the Atlantic Council logo. Uh, but I think we, we've successfully, at least for those who did vote it, who did vote, we did, we did at least reduce the number of unsures and we've left the, the room divided uh, between yes and no, but at least we've given you more uh, ideas to, to, uh, to ponder as you move forward. I wanna with that, again, thank Deputy Assistant Secretary Filippetti for, for your time uh, and all the incredible work that you are doing uh, at the State Department in, adv in advancing a democratic transition uh, in Venezuela. Uh, Alejandro Grisanti, Ann Lee and Francisco Monaldi. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you.